Blessed morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Pastor John Ellingworth here from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church in Waverly, Iowa, bringing you today's readings and prayers from the Treasury of Daily Prayer. Today is Thursday, March 28th. It is Holy Thursday or Monday Thursday, um, a very important day in our Holy Week observance. The beginning of the sacred triduum, which means three days. Uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Uh, when you go to your churches today or tonight or, to, you know, and throughout this uh, triduum, you should remember that the services of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday are, in a sense, one service. Uh, so, like, for instance, um, the Monday service ending, or service, the Monday Thursday service, easy for me to say, uh, is a fairly straightforward, normal divine service, um, but it ends very differently. It ends, um, at least in most churches, uh, Lutheran churches, with the stripping of the altar, um, representing how um, after the Lord's Supper, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prayed and um, they all fell asleep. And then Judas arrived with soldiers from the uh, uh, the chief priests and uh, the temple guard and they arrested Jesus and we begin his trials through the night. And so the stripping of the altar represents the abandonment of Jesus by his um, uh, closest friends, his disciples, and all the world, quite honestly, and the beginning of his passion. Um, the Lord's Supper is typically celebrated in our churches on Monday, Thursday, because this is the day that we observe the commemoration of the institution of the Lord's Supper. But um, what starts off as a fairly joyful and somewhat ordinary service very quickly uh, changes into um sorrow and deep reflection over our sin, which um, caused Jesus to be abandoned and uh, tried by um, pagans, by Gentiles, and uh, crucified. And of course, this was all God's will. Um, he was crushed for our iniquities, um, etc. And uh, by his stripes, we are healed. But um, since the service ends in a very non-traditional way, there's no benediction at the end, the Lord bless you and keep you, it, it ends in darkness, and we typically leave the sanctuary in silence, and we come back on Friday, and the service starts very abruptly uh, in silence with no none of the usual beginning, um, and uh, most churches observe um, a tenebrae service, which is a form of vespers, really, that's what we do here. Um, some will do what they call the chief service on Good Friday, which is a communion service, but it's still missing the beginning and the end of a normal divine service because it's really in the middle. It's a continuation of the events of Thursday night. So we go through Friday, the day, the observance of Jesus' crucifixion, and that goes right into Saturday, um, which is called the um, it's called Holy Saturday or it's called the Easter Vigil, which is traditionally celebrated in the evening as sun goes down. And um, it's a, that is a continuation of Good Friday, and it represents Jesus' rest in the tomb all day Saturday, fulfilling the Sabbath for us. And the congregation dwell uh, gathers outdoors, outside of the church, um, as darkness sets, and a new fire is struck. And um, the Christ candle, the Paschal candle, um, is marked with um, the year of uh, 2024 in this case, and incense nails are put in representing the wounds of Christ and his hands, his feet, his side, and his head. Um, and that candle is used throughout the year uh, for baptisms and for funerals. It'll be used during the Easter season, um, and it marks the presence of Christ, his glorious resurrected presence amongst us. So already on Saturday night, and this is kind of strange for Westerners because um, our we have to think like Jews when we think of how our days work, that when sun sets on the day that we think of Saturday, that's actually the beginning of the third day. That's the beginning of the day we think we know of as Sunday. And so the church gathers um, early Sunday, which is actually late Saturday from our way of thinking. And um, it's called a vigil. A vigil is a long prayer service, right? And they, the Christians would have prayed all night long, um, past midnight most likely, into the wee hours of the morning. And um, the service 
if you go to a Holy Saturday service, a vigil service, it, it's usually marked by a number of Old Testament readings. Uh, there are 12, they're appointed, um, so a church could do all 12, um, but I think more typical is uh, three or six or something like that. And uh, those Old Testament readings all have some kind of a prophetic um, a connection to um, the Passover, to uh, Jesus' death and resurrection, um, to our redemption. There's, for instance, uh, the story of creation. There's um, Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. There's the flood. Uh, there's the Red Sea crossing. Um, there's uh, the three men in the fiery furnace. Uh, there's several, like there's 12 readings, and it's it's a wonderful experience. If you get to hear them all, it's a lengthy service if you hear them all, but um, it's a great meditation. And then um, after that cycle of readings, uh, the things transform from darkness into bright light. And actually, um, after the homily, um, it is Easter. Already on Saturday night, it's Easter, and Alleluia is sung again. The Glory in Excelsis is sung again. Um, hymns of praise are sung again. Um, the banners are changed, perhaps, from black to white. Um, and uh, it really is the first breaking forth of the resurrection, the good news that Jesus has risen already on Saturday evening. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but my feeling is that here in uh, North America, in our Western part of the world, um, we, we have this thing called the sunrise service, the Easter sunrise service. That does not have a long historical precedent outside of North America, as far as I know. And I think the reason we ended up getting the Easter sunrise service is because um, people thought, well, why not, rather than stay up Saturday night, let us just get up early uh, on Sunday morning at the crack of dawn. I mean, we're farmers after all. We get up early anyway. Let's just get up early and um, celebrate the resurrection then uh, when the women arrived at the tomb is the rationale there. But I think that what happened is, is we they the Western, when I say Western, I mean really North America. The North American uh, churches have supplanted the Easter vigil with uh, the sunrise service and um, I think that's a loss. I think that's a loss because the sunrise service is really just a straightforward Easter service for for most churches. And there's none of the Old Testament readings and the marking of the candle and the new fire and all that kind of thing. And those are very important things as we make that transition from the darkness of Good Friday to the light of Jesus' resurrection. It's a beautiful thing. So if you can observe all three days, the Holy Triduum that begins today with Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, and then come to church on Easter Sunday, um, I think you get the whole cycle and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I encourage you uh, to go to your church uh, for those services that are offered. If you don't have a home church, um, go visit a, a Lutheran church. Go go visit a liturgical LCMS church where you can find these services. And I think you will be deeply rewarded uh, for um, participating in that commemoration and meditation. Okay, I've been talking a lot there. Um, just wanted to give you a little heads up there. There'll be some more about that at the end of the service or the, the readings today. I've got service on the brain. So again, uh, today is Holy Thursday, otherwise known as Monday Thursday. Where does Monday come from? Um, it, it comes from the Latin word mandatum, um, which gets translated into English as commandment uh, because Jesus says in the gospel, a new commandment, a new mandate I give to you that you should love one another as I have loved you so must you love one another. And so um, that's part of where that name comes from. I've heard other explanations that says it has something to do with um, uh, an, an old English or medieval word for springtime. I don't really buy that. I think the mandatum makes a lot more sense and, um, and, and bears itself out historically. So uh, let me begin. Again, our readings are on page 170. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm is a portion of Psalm 37. Martin Luther um, says about 37th psalm in this book, reading the psalms with Luther. Psalm 37. The 37th psalm is a psalm of comfort that teaches and exhorts us to have patience in the world and warns us especially against envy, for it is a vexing and painful um, thing to the weak in faith when things go well for the godless and the opposite happens to those who fear God. It is a great spiritual virtue when seeing the great misdeeds of the peasants, the townspeople, the nobility, the princes, and everyone who has any power, one yet exerts himself not to blaspheme or inwardly wish this or that curse on them. Moreover, he still suffers and sees that all things go well for them and they remain unpunished. Indeed, they are praised and honored, while the God-fearing are miserable, despised, hated, begrudged, obstructed, vexed, and persecuted. Boy, ain't that the truth. 
um, I don't know if you've seen the latest thing in the news, but uh, for a Christian to say Christ is King is now being called anti-Semitic and uh, a sign or a, like a wolf call or a signal, a dog signal uh, for um, what they're calling Christian nationalism, which is kind of equated with Nazism or fascism or something. It's absolutely absurd where the simple proclamation from the Bible that is proclaimed throughout the New Testament uh, that and it even prophesied in the Old Testament that Christ is the king, not only of Christians, but of all people, of Jews, Gentiles, and everyone. That was the promise made to Abraham, after all, through a son from your own body, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That the central message of the Bible, Christ is king, Christus Rex, um, is now considered bigoted, uh, anti-Semitic, and, um, and hate speech, uh, a sign of fascism or Nazism or something like that. Continuing on with Luther, though, the message is learn to have endurance. Take your heart to God and do not let yourself be vexed. Do not become envious or curse or with evil to fall or murmur or look at them with hatred. Let these people go and commend them to God, who will surely find all things out. Uh, the psalm teaches this and comforts us in a variety of ways with abundant promises and with examples and warnings, for it is a great and difficult art to manifest such patient long-suffering when reason and all the heathen count envy as a virtue. For it appears as though it were just and fair to envy and begrudge the, un the ungodly for their wantonness, their good fortune, and their riches. All right, so do not be vexed by um, the wicked when they seem to prosper even though they are wicked and uh, where you, O Christian, who are trying to obey the laws of God and keep his word and love your neighbor are um, often um, uh, persecuted, slandered, um, cursed, mocked, ridiculed in some way because of your faithfulness. Okay, Psalm 37, 1 to 7. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices." good advice. This is the word of the Lord. Our Old Testament reading is Exodus 12, 1 to 28, the account of the Passover, how appropriate on Holy Thursday. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, and if a household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn." In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the homes where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove the leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. 
No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month, at evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is on the, in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and they worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Very important um, passage here. Um, and our Lord's Supper is deeply connected to this. Um, it was a Passover meal. Uh, or a Passover remembrance of some sort that Jesus and the disciples were celebrating uh, on on the night he was betrayed on Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday, before he was um, arrested in the garden and his passion rightly begun. Um, so we have this initial uh, command by the Lord to do this as a service, a service of remembrance. And um, there was a blog post going around yesterday um, on Facebook um, that I shared. And um, it was basically asking, who's doing the remembering in the Lord's Supper? You know, uh, Jesus commands, do this in remembrance of me. Um, it is God who remembers. Um, God has given uh, us this rite, this ritual that we do. Um, yes, we do remember. Well, what we are remembering is God's faithfulness. That um, And it takes us all the way back to the Exodus, right? His faithfulness with Israel while they were slaves in Egypt. Even before that, his faithfulness to Joseph and all of his travails that led the people of Israel to Egypt um, and kept them alive during the famine. Um but also remembering his mighty deliverance through Moses and Aaron and how he took care of his people in the wilderness and, and kept his promise and led them into Canaan, the promised land, and blessed them and made them a blessing. Uh, but ultimately how he gave his own son, Jesus, uh, to redeem us from um, the Pharaoh that is Satan and the Egypt that is hell. Um, he has uh, Jesus has gone to Egypt to hell for us, and he has defeated Pharaoh, Satan, for us. You see the connections I'm making here. Um, and his blood marks our doorways, uh, the doorways of our lips, of our, of our tongue, and God's wrath against sin passes over us uh, because that sin has been atoned for in Jesus' death and in the shedding of his blood. And so when we do this in remembrance of me, we're not just remembering an event in Jesus' life or the institution of the supper. We're remembering the whole redemptive work of God. And moreover, we're calling God to remembrance while we do this thing. We, we keep repeating it over and over again because God has to pay attention to it. He has to remember his covenant. I know it sounds weird to, you know, how could God forget? You know, why do we have to constantly remind God? Well, we don't. I mean, God doesn't forget. But um, how many times in the Old Testament, particularly, does it say that God remembered the covenant that he made to Abraham? God remembered the promise that he made uh, to Noah, you know, not to flood the earth. again. God remembered this. God remembered his mercy and that kind of thing. And so um, that's what 
you know, when Jacob wrestled with God, the angel all night long, and he says, I won't let you go without a blessing. What he's doing is he's holding God to remembrance of his promise made to him and uh, to make a great nation from him. And uh, that's what the Canaanite woman uh, did when she held Jesus' feet. Um, and he called her a dog and insulted her and ignored her. And she held on anyway and said, Lord, help me. And she wouldn't let go of him. She's calling him to remember his promises. And that's that's what we're doing too. Every time we have the Lord's Supper, we're calling God to remember that the Passover blood has been shed. He has given his son as a sacrifice. Um, our sins are atoned for. It is finished. There's nothing left to do. And we are holding God to that. And God loves it when we hold him to his promises. So um, the people of Israel were to um, enact, reenact this Passover every year on this specific date in remembrance of what God has done for themselves, but even more so reminding God of the promise that he has made and that we haven't forgotten and we're holding him to it. Amen. Absolutely. Our New Testament reading is Hebrews 5. 1 to 14. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward since he himself is beset with weakness because he took on human flesh. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when God, uh, when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus is our great high priest. Um, he um, doesn't have to make atonement for his own sins, but he does because he takes our sins, the whole world's sins, upon himself. And so he makes atonement for our sins uh, by bringing not the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but his own innocent shed blood, thus gaining for us an eternal uh, redemption, one that can never be revoked. It is finished. Um, and Christ did not choose this office for himself. Um, he was appointed by the Lord and made a high priest uh, after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is this interesting figure from Genesis. Um, first of all, his name, Melchizedek, Melchizedek. Melchi is king and Zedek is righteousness. That's one of the names for the Messiah, right? For Jesus, the king of righteousness. And he is also the king of Salem. Well, Salem is shalom, it's peace. And uh, Jesus also is the king of peace. Um, Melchizedek strangely has seemingly no beginning and no end. He seems to be like an eternal figure. Um, we get that more from Hebrews than we do from Genesis, but Hebrews is a commentary on that. And so that also matches with, um, with uh, Jesus. So Jesus is our great high priest from before the foundation of the world, just as he was the lamb that would take away the sins of the world before the foundation of the world. Before there was a man, before there was sin, um, Christ was crucified for us. And these are ideas uh, that are beyond our understanding because they're beyond our uh, linear time life and our way of thinking. You know, we experience time just one second after another, one minute after one decade, one century after another, and we can only go forward. We can't go back. And so we, we can't understand things that are truly outside of time, that are truly eternal. God is eternal. The son of God is eternal. There's never been a time that is not. So God sees all time at the same time. We can only see the time that is before us. What we think of as past is really just memory, right? 
Can you find the past? Can you touch the past? Can you point to it? No, it's gone. But you remember it until you don't remember it anymore. And then what happens to things that we don't remember? They don't exist for us anymore. And that's one of the great problems we have on why there's that proverb, you know, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Well, that's true. As we forget our history, um, it's like it never happened in the first place. And that's a terrible, terrible thing. I'll just throw this little thing in here. Um, some of the hymns of our church, the beautiful hymns like Martin Luther hymns and, and earlier hymns than that, uh, people don't want to sing today. They sound old. They're not familiar with them. They were never taught them properly. Well, I, I keep saying that if we don't sing these hymns, then they're going to be gone forever. You know, how, how long does it take before a church um, forgets hymns and doesn't know it anymore? Or if they stop doing the liturgy, how long does it take? Really one generation, one generation that hasn't been taught this by the previous generation will not teach the next generation and they're gone to obscurity. So like uh, this came up about for Easter Sunday, the hymn of the day is Luther's great Easter hymn, Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands. And uh, uh, it was asked, can't we sing a different hymn of the day for Easter? Do we have to sing that hymn all the time? I'm like, well, that's Luther's Easter hymn. If we Lutherans don't sing it, then who will? You know, nobody else is going to sing it. And it's a great hymn. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. But today's ears hear it as old and dated and perhaps difficult to sing if they're not familiar with it. And... Um, are we willing to let these hymns go? I'm not. I'm not will willing to let them go. Uh, so we need to uh, keep them alive. Okay. Um, there's this last little bit here that goes along with what I was just saying about um, how we need to do things that we don't um, like to do sometimes just for the sake of keeping the teaching alive and the tradition alive. Um, the writer, preacher to Hebrews here says to the people, See, I believe that Hebrews is a sermon, um, so it's a preacher that's given this message, not a written letter like Paul's epistles. And uh, so he's preaching to a congregation of Jewish Christians. And um, he's kind of chiding them that um, they've known this for a long time. They should be teachers of this of this doctrine to others, but instead they've become like children again because they become dull of ear. They don't want to hear it. Um, they're tired of hearing this old talk over and over and over again. They want to hear something new, something novel. Gosh, you know, flesh always wants something novel except when it doesn't. Yeah. The flesh doesn't know what it wants, you know, and that's why we need to stick to things that are tried and true and that best convey the truth, whether they're dull in our ears or not, you know, um, what's dull in our ears is up and down, um, like the fluctuations of our emotions. You know, we, our faith is not built on such unstable things. Our faith is built on solid rock, you know, on truth. And so we need to do that. And, uh, that's what Paul is saying. <laughs> I do. I betrayed myself there because I do believe that this preacher is none other than Paul. And that, that has great tradition in the church, although it's debated today. Um, but for my purposes, this is a sermon that Paul delivered to a um, Jewish Christian congregation, and it was written down by a scribe. Paul didn't write it with his own hand, and so some of the language in it, um, the teaching, it sounds very much like Paul, but uh, some would point to the Greek, the way the Greek's written. And so, well, that's not the way Paul writes. We have lots of examples of Paul's writing, and it's different than Paul. I think the reason is for that is the teaching is Paul. It, it came out of his mouth, but it was transcribed or written down by a scribe, by somebody else. And um, that explains the differences in the Greek that's used. But um, I, I don't think you can argue with the teaching. that It, it sounds like Paul. It's consistent with Paul in his epistles. And uh, it's, it's somebody that knows the Old Testament very well, um, like a Pharisee, like Paul would know. Uh, but he says that um, you should be teachers yourselves, but you, you're more like children because of the dullness of your ears. You, you need milk, not solid food. Um Solid food is for the mature. And um, dear listener, um, I like to think that what you're getting here as we talk and expound on these things is you're getting you're getting milk. I mean, but you're also getting solid food because I'm my goal is to help you dig deeper into these texts, uh, not to explain every detail, but that's beyond our purpose and scope. But uh, to share with you some of these things that will open this text up to you to a deeper connection and meaning. Um, and it all points to Christ. It's all about Christ. Amen. Today's writing comes from CFW Walther. You know who Walther is, right? He was the uh, the first um, Lutheran LCMS um, uh, synod president. He was uh, the founder and the first president of our um, St. Louis Seminary, um, uh, great father of the church here in North America. 
Um, he wrote the book Law and Gospel. Uh, he did not invent the doctrine, but he certainly expounded on it probably more than any other Lutheran teacher has. The Apostle Paul wishes to say, consider, beloved Christians, that when you receive the blessed cup and the blessed bread, each one partakes of the body and the blood of Christ. They are both common to all of you. You come into the body and blood fellowship with one another. For just as many grains become one bread, so in the Holy Supper, you though uh, who are many become one body, one mass, because you are partakers of the one bread and with it and uh, the one same body and blood of Christ. So he's talking about how when you take the Lord's Supper, you have communion with Christ, but you also have communion with each other. And uh, notice the cruciform shape there, right? Um, uh, what's the great commandment, right? That you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. What is Jesus' new commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you, so you should love one another, okay? Uh, so this is what Walter is talking about in communion. There's both a, a vertical communion fellowship between the individual believer and Christ, and there's a horizontal between each individual believer and Christ, okay? So we are all one in Christ, in the Lord's Supper. Come union, union with get it? So you think this horizontal is not so important as the vertical? Well, you are wrong. Um, the horizontal is just as important. As a matter of fact, the horizontal is the fruit of the vertical. And if um, if the horizontal is broken or is not, not happening, it's a sure sign that there's a problem with the vertical relationship. If you properly love God, love Christ, and are in union with him, then you will properly love one another. Because of this presence and participation to the body of Christ, the Holy Supper is a meal of the most intimate fellowship, yes, and therefore at the same time the highest love meal. Just as fervent love is demanded, so fervent love is delivered. We all come together as children of the same family to the table, our common Heavenly Father. As great as the distinction between communicants and civic life may be, in the Holy Supper, all distinctions evaporate. We are all the same in that we eat, each eat at the same earthly and heavenly bread and drink the same earthly and heavenly drink. In this meal, the subject and his king, the slave and his master, the beggar and the rich, the child and the old man, the wife and the husband, the simple and the learned, truly all communicants, stand as the same poor sinners and beggars, hungry and thirsty for grace, Although one may appear in a rough apron, while another in velvet and satin adorned with gold and pearls, when they depart, all that all take with them that for which they hunger and thirst, Christ's blood and righteousness as their beauty and glorious dress. No one receives a better food and drink than the other. All receive the same, Jesus, and with him the same righteousness. Thank you, Dr. Walther. That is beautiful, profound, and perfectly stated. Our Lenten catechesis um, is the question, who receives the sacrament worthily? Since the treasure of this sacrament is entirely presented in the words, it cannot be received and made ours in any other way than with the heart. Fasting, prayer, and other such things may indeed be outward preparations and discipline for children so that the body may, be, uh, may keep and bring itself modestly and reverently to receive Christ's body and blood. Yet the body cannot seize and make its own what is given in and with the sacrament. This is done by the faith in the heart, which discerns this treasure and desires it. Having, having the true understanding and doctrine of the sacrament, there is also need for some admonition and encouragement. Then people may not let such a great treasure, daily administered and distributed among Christians, pass by unnoticed. For we see that people seem weary and lazy about receiving the sacrament. They act as though they were such strong Christians that they have no need of it. Indeed, I've heard that argument. You know, Pastor, if we have the sacrament every Sunday, then it'll become mundane. It'll become ordinary. We won't, it won't be special to us anymore. My dear Christian, that is a failing of your flesh and your thinking. Um, it should always be special to you. You should desire to receive it as often as it is offered to you. Um, we've got that completely backwards. 
Um, some pretend that it is a matter of liberty and not necessary. They pretend that it is enough to believe without it. That's an even worse approach. For the most part, they go so far astray that they become quite brutish and finally despise both the sacrament and God's word. No one should by any means be forced or compelled to go to the sacrament, lest we institute a new murdering of souls. Nevertheless, it must be known that people who deprive themselves of and withdraw from the sacrament for such a long time are not to be considered Christians. For Christ has commanded his Christians to eat it, drink it, and remember him by it. Indeed, those who are true Christians and value the sacrament, precious and holy, will drive and move themselves to go to it. There is also need for daily encouragement, and there is need for us to continue to preach so that people may not become weary and disgusted. For we know and feel how the devil always opposes this, and every Christian exercise he drives and deters people from them as much as he can. That's all from the large catechism, and that means it's all from Luther. And man, I love the way he says that. Okay, it is Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday. Just a little background here beyond what I already told you. Monday, Thursday the day of the commandment, diest mandate, most properly refers to the example of service given us by our Lord and the directive to love as we have been loved. Yet we must not forget the command given in the words of our Lord to do this in remembrance of me. This day, with its commemoration of the institution of the Lord's Supper, is set off from the rest of the Holy Week as a day of festive joy. All right, uh, let us pray. The Lord be with you. O Lord, in this wondrous sacrament, you have left us a remembrance of your passion. Grant that we may so receive the sacred mystery of your body and blood, that the fruits of your redemption may continually be manifest in us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed day. I'll see you tomorrow on Good Friday. <laughs>